Right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you from San Diego. And today I'm delighted to welcome back Wayne Mullins, who is in Louisiana. How are you doing, Wayne? I'm well, John. How are you? Great, great. And Wayne is uh, CEO, entrepreneur, author, uh, and uh, he founded Ugly Mug Marketing, which is won a lot of praise over the years. Uh, and what we're going to talk about today is Wayne's book. Here it is. Full Circle Marketing. Transform your marketing and turn customers into uh, evangelists. So, um, Wayne, let, let's get straight into it here. Uh, and in the first part of your book, you talk about the marketing rock. And I just think that's a, it's a fascinating it's a fascinating story and it's a fascinating way to start and it illustrates a really kind of, a really profound point so could you just explain the the marketing rock and the thinking behind it and what the message is yeah absolutely um you know it, it sounds like this magical mystical thing um so the the rock that john's talking about it's generated more than a million dollars in business for us over the course of a 13 year period um now, all of that sounds fantastic. All of that sounds great. And now once I start explaining what this rock is, people are like, uh, okay, something's not right here. But let me tell you what the rock is and then briefly tell you why it works. So first of all, the rock is literally a small rock that you would go by maybe at a garden center or if you're lucky walking down a gravel road, pick it up. Um, it's the type of rock you would want to skip across water. So it's smooth. It's kind of rounded. And we took these rocks and we would write the simple message on them. Effective marketing doesn't have to be expensive. And then we would put our web address. We then would take these rocks and leave them around town. We'd leave them in restaurants, on tables. We'd leave them in coffee shops. We'd leave them hotel lobbies. Anywhere that people may sit and congregate, we would leave these rocks. Um, What's so interesting about that, that one particular thing, that one particular rock, is it's really the basis for the two frameworks that get laid out or that we talk about through the course of the book. The rock works so well because it follows these frameworks. It follows some proven, I, I guess you could say these are human psychology things. Right. Um, it's not tech, right? This is <laughs> the most non-tech thing that you could do with marketing. And yet it works because we are following a couple of what I would call natural laws as it relates to marketing. And, and what I like about that, Wayne, what you just said is, I mean, let's face it, we're a technology company. We have the CRM, uh, you know, we have email uh, and marketing built in and all that. However, I, I agree with you. It's, a, it's refreshing to come back to the underlying fundamentals and strip away the technology for, for a moment and actually talk about the, psycho, because the psychological part of it. Because at the end of the day, that's really that's what drives decisions. It's not the technology itself. It's, this, it's the interaction and the psychology of interacting with it. Yeah, absolutely. You can have the best tech in the world, the best tool in the world, the best platform in the world, the biggest audience in the world. But if you violate some very basic foundational human psychology things, uh, your messages are going to fall flat. They're not going to resonate. People are not going to take action. And you will never convert customers into evangelists without these yeah. things. And so you also talk about, you know, what marketing is and what marketing isn't. And I, and I think that's, uh, and I think that's something that I'd just like to discuss for a moment, because we always assume you know, we're great at assumptions, right? As humans, we always assume that we know, we go, yeah, marketing, I understand what marketing is. Uh, but if you have to actually ask somebody to define what is marketing, what is it and what is it not? I think a lot of people would struggle. Yeah, you know, in our work as an agency, we talk with business owners all the time, and they're coming to us typically for marketing help. And so one of the very first places we love to start is asking their opinion, asking them to define what is marketing. Because what we know to be true is if we can't even define marketing correctly, we have zero hope, right? Zero chances yep. of getting it right. So the way we define it, John, is simply this. Marketing is your ability to attract and to keep a customer. Now, when we say keep a customer, there's a little bit more to it than just keep, right? It's not about them mm -hmm. coming back every few years and buying. When we say keep, what we mean is we want to convert customers into evangelists for our products, our services, or our brands. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. And and the other thing is, I, I like one of the other things that you um, mentioned here about the fact that you're not in your book, and I think this is refreshing, you're not pitching the uh, do your ab workout for three minutes every two months and you're going to have a six pack uh, because, you know, we found a breakthrough easy way. You say, no, it's, 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 it's not easy or short term quick fixes. It's long term success, long term thinking and long term strategies. That is that is exactly it. But as business owners, as entrepreneurs, and look, I'm in this category. I, I, I'm still that person as well. Um, we often get so short-sighted as it relates to our marketing. And the way that it typically works, John, is this, that we participate in what I call ad rep strategy. So the ad rep who walks in the door or the ad rep who calls us on the phone and says, hey, we've got this phenomenal deal this month for this month only, <laughs> you know, if you buy this plan, we'll double your order. You know, it's kind of the infomercial thing. Mm -hmm. And because we are so busy doing a million other things, putting out all kinds of fires, we, we know in the back of our heads that we need to be doing this thing called marketing. So we tell the rep, yes, sounds great. And if that's not bad enough, John, we then commit the next sin, which is this. The rep says, wonderful, we're excited for you to do this. What do you want the ad to actually say? <laughs> and what do we say? Oh, you know, I really don't have time to figure that out right now. Tell you what, you go put something together for me, bring it back, and we'll go from there. And so what most entrepreneurs end up with are all of these different campaigns, all of these different ads running in various places, and there is no strategic thought behind them. There is no long-term thinking whatsoever. It's tactic after tactic. And I call it also the spaghetti strategy, right? We throw mm -hmm. all this stuff against the wall. We see what sticks. And then we try to figure out why it worked or why it didn't. Yeah. And then just because it sticks, we, you know, one time we think, okay, this is great. And it's, it's going to scale. And oftentimes we find, yeah, it sticks once or twice, but it doesn't scale. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that goes back to this kind of framework or systematic thinking as it relates to our marketing. When we have actual frameworks or systems in place around our marketing, the beauty of that, John, is that it gives us the ability to look at the system from above and see where something is broken, right? So if I go get my car this morning and I start to back out of the driveway and the car, I can like hear the sound coming from the back wheel. Like it, it feels like something's wrong with the back wheel. I don't get out and then go look under the hood and say <laughs> something's wrong under the hood. But yet that's exactly what we do as marketers, right? Something's not working, but the problem is we have no clue where to look because there's no system in, in place that gives us that ability. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point. Uh, I love that analogy. I never look under the hood because I have no idea what's going on there anyway. So it's never an issue for me. Um, so talk to me a little bit about the, the IDA framework, because you talk about AIDA and that it goes all the way back to 1910. And what I like about this part here is the fact is we've become so... I guess, future focus or instant, like that we always want new, new, there's new, like throw out all the old rules and, and, uh, and nothing. And we just ignore anything that may have enduring wisdom or may still be relevant. Uh, and, and I think that's a kind of pervasive thing out there is like, we were told, we love to throw the baby out with the bathwater and think, oh yeah, we've got something brand new. Yeah. Yeah. We, we live in that world, don't we? The world of mm -hmm. the new thing, the new thing's the best thing. Uh, the world we also live in is this world of complexity bias. For some reason, we believe that if something is not complicated and there's not lots of steps and you know lots of parts in the sequence, that it can't be that good. If it's simple, it must not be able to work. And that is what I love about this framework. I call it AIDA or IDA. I don't know how you actually say it. It's an acronym that stands, each letter stands for something. Um, but the beauty of this one little framework, John, is that when we use this to create our ads, to create our campaigns, it gives us a viewpoint to look back in and say, okay, where did we miss the boat? Where did we leave something out that is going to cause this campaign or causing this campaign not to work well? So if, you, if you'd like, I'll just briefly run yeah, through please, each of Yeah, please do. Yeah. Sure. So the first one, uh, the first letter is an A, and that stands for attention. If we don't capture attention, if we don't get people to stop on their tracks and notice us, the rest of it doesn't matter, right? We mm. must start with 
attention. So that is step one, attention. And, step- and just, I'm, I'm sorry, just by the way, Wayne, I mean, and that, that alone is its own challenge today because everybody is so distracted. We, we do live in a very distracted world, but this is just, just to give a couple of ideas on how people can go about finding ways to stand out. Number one, um, when you're scrolling through, like if you're advertising on, on Instagram or Facebook or wherever it may be, as you're going through, what are the pieces that cause you to stop and pay attention? And then begin saving those pieces, create a library. Now, again, if you're not the same person as your customer avatar, then, then it does no good. But if you are in that same avatar, right, it does good to begin building out this library of things, even if they're completely unrelated, that calls you to step out or stand out. The other thing that I would say a great way to capture attention is to look outside your industry. We often put on these blinders and we stay so focused on the industry that we operate in that we miss tremendous opportunity. Um, this, the story I love to tell about this is that, you know, when we think of drive through windows, the place we typically think of would be fast food restaurants, right? That's where drive through windows mm-hmm. are. Fast food restaurants were not the ones who invented the drive through window. The drive through window comes from the bank. Mm. It wasn't until almost four years later, after the banks were using it, that restaurants picked up on the idea. So again, I use that analogy to say, get you know, outside of your industry, look outside at other places, look for those ways to capture attention. Yeah, no, that's a fantastic, great, great. I, I didn't know that. So there you are. I learned something new today myself. And and the other thing is you mentioned here is about the the amount of uh, like the amount of marketing messages that we're exposed to on a daily basis, like five thousand or something. Yeah, and and you know, there's no sign of that slowing down. <laughs> No, absolutely. Uh, okay, so the next one. So that was attention. The next one is interest. Yeah, key point here, John, is this, that people are interested in their interest, not in our product or services. And over time, we can't see this, right? Because we're busy trying to convince, trying to persuade. And so what happens is we begin shifting the focus of our messaging around our product or around our service. And that is a huge mistake. Instead, we need to make sure that our our marketing is centered around their particular interest. You know, know, so think about golf for a second. If you love golf um, and we make golf clubs, it would be a mistake for us to assume that you're interested in our golf clubs. You're interested in this hobby called golf. Now, if we have a product that helps you in your interest, you know, shoot a better score, beat your friends, beat your competition, then yes, you're going you're gonna to give us some of that attention, right? And some of that interest. But if somebody else comes along that serves that interest better, they're going to move on, which, you know, that really actually ties into the next letter, which is D for desire. Desire exists when we realize that something better exists in the marketplace. That's something better. So the question becomes for us as marketers, salespeople, what are we doing? to evoke desire? What are we doing to show them that a better state exists for them? Yeah, no, I, I love that because because uh, at the end of the day, that that is, I mean, that tie, ties in all the emotion. Because I think sometimes even as marketers and certainly as sales, is like we, we, we tend to take the emotion out of it uh, somehow. And we think, you know, that if we talk logically or whatever to, to the customer, that then that's all well and good. But to your point about the golfers, right? is if I'm a golfer, and I'm not, uh, <laughs> as anyone who's ever played golf with me back in the day can testify, um, is uh, I'm not interested in the particular club. I'm interested in the fact that it's going to let me hit it longer and straighter. Yeah, yep. No, that, that's exactly it. It goes back to, to the analogy that most salespeople have heard. You know, People don't want to buy the drill uh, or the drill bit. They want, to, they want to buy the hole in the wall. And if we mm-hmm. take that a step further, so if we take that idea a step further, they don't actually want the hole in the wall. They want the picture of their family on the wall. Yeah. They want that desire. That's their desire. So again, it's beyond just you know, that next step. It's, it's we got to peel back that layer a little bit deeper and look at, you know, and in the book, we talk about some of the human psychology behind, behind this stuff. Um, so that's where we've got to get to with our messaging. Yeah. And then, and the last one is action. 
The last step is action. And, and John, believe it or not, this is the one that I would say most people mess up on. Um, they spend all this time and attention, you know, trying to figure out how to get the first part of the messaging right, um, first part of the campaign right. And by the time they get to this last little bit, they make an assumption, and we talked about this earlier, they make an assumption that people automatically know what to do next. So you must have a very specific call to action. We call it a singular path for exactly what to do next. Not the next 10 steps. People are going to take one step next. What is the next logical step after interacting with our messaging or interacting with our campaign? What is that next step? Yeah, and, uh, it, and it is, and, and it seems, again, I mean, it seems like a very simple piece of advice, but we clearly see it often is, that's, is that people present you with a number of different options or different paths or whatever to the point where it's like I always say, like, if you put if you put three doors in front of somebody, they'll choose a door. If you put eight doors in front of them, they'll just be paralyzed by choice. Yeah, no, no, that's exactly it. If you want a great example of ads that run with no call to action, watch Super Bowl ads. <laughs> it's, full <laughs> of them. it's full of them. <laughs> Absolutely. And uh, there was another th- part that I just wanted to draw attention to. And I loved what you said is intentionally manufacturing trust. Mm. That's an interesting concept. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, in marketing and in sales, um, trust is the currency. That is the thing. And in the book, I talk about where trust goes, money flows. And so if we think of just basic human psychology, we know, you know, it's true for sales, it's true for marketing. It's just that, you know, obviously people have to know about us. They have to Mm -hmm. like us. And then that third component is that word trust. And here's where so many entrepreneurs, so many business owners get into trouble. So initially, let's say we're going out and we're launching this new thing, new product, new service, could be an entirely new company. Um, The first people who adopt that, the early adopters, are typically people who are close to us, whether that's friends, family, acquaintances, um, previous customers. So they're really close. They're like one degree of separation away from us. Now, as we begin to scale, as we begin to expand our business, we have to begin reaching people that are two or three or four degrees of separation away from us, right? And the mistake that we make as marketers, and I believe this is true for salespeople as well, as well, is we don't manufacture. We aren't intentional about putting trust into the equation or into the messaging or into the campaigns that we're creating. Yeah, I, and I think that's a great point because I do think uh, everybody will agree if you say to them, "Is trust important?" Oh, yes, it's fundamental, and people buy from people they trust, or people, you know, marketing, you know, they believe what you say if they trust your brand. But very few people know how to actively build that. They think that you just build trust by showing up and you know, talking and doing the right thing, which is part of it, but it's more than that. Yeah, it's so much more than that. And, you know, John, in the world that we live in today, and we talked about, you know, the number of messages that are coming at us Mm -hmm. a bit earlier, um, we live in a world where people would rather trust strangers they've never met than to trust you or I. So if I'm out here, you know, I'm going to sit here and tell you how wonderful and how great our company is and our products or services are, you're naturally going to be cynical and skeptical about me and about the messages that I'm putting out. Why? Because you know that I'm biased. You know that I have, um, you know, there's something in it for me, right? If you do business with us, there's some reward of some sort for me. And so we live in this world where literally people won't buy a tube of toothpaste on Amazon without scrolling down and reading the reviews. And here's the thing, John, the people who left those reviews for that toothpaste, they could all be crazy. They could have all been paid, right? Right. From the company. They could, have, they could all have no teeth. <laughs> they could all have no teeth, exactly. And yet, we trust them more than we trust the company who actually made the toothpaste. And, you know, when I, when I talk about this to people, sometimes they get, they're like, you know, it's depressing. Like, they, they view this as bad news. But I believe if we flip our perspective and say, no, this is wonderful news, because now when we have intention around building trust with our clients, with our customers, we can utilize them. We can transform them into evangelists who then go out and share, who impart their trust, their belief in us to their friends, to their family, to their coworkers, et cetera. 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that's when you get, you know, somebody who moves from one company to another and brings you with them, or as you say, like, you know, will refer you, will bring other customers in. Like, it's a, it's, it's a very, it's a very profound point, uh, the, the whole trust element, but you're right, is we're so hung up on third party validation right now is that sometimes I think we forget about our own. Mm, yeah, that's good. Yeah. And just one last thing, you talk about breaking patterns in the book, maybe that would be a good place to finish, because I always think that breaking patterns is a good thing. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, well, I, I talk about neg- you know, patterns that aren't serving you, put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, so I talk about it in the book just briefly, but, uh, and I don't remember the exact stat off the top of my head, but a huge percent of our day takes place on automation, like the habits run our day for us for the most part. And when it comes to business, when it comes to sales, when it comes to anything entrepreneurial, we fall into the same type of habits, the same type of patterns. And the reality is, John, just like, you know, going through our day, we don't realize the habits that are, that are actually bringing us through the day, that are taking us through the day. The same happens in business. We don't realize all of these, these things that are taking place that we're aware of but we're not really consciously aware that they're taking place. You know, a great example of that is this. When we talk about brand, your brand, like our brand isn't what we believe or what we think about ourselves. Our brand is what other people believe about us. And so here's the thing. Like when I say that, people are like, well, yeah, that that makes sense. But if I flip the question and say, okay, if that is true, and you know that is true, what are you doing to intentionally help them believe certain things about you? What are you doing to influence, not just pre-sale, but post-sale, so that you can actually convert those people to evangelists for you? Yeah, no, I think that's a great point. And I do think that that's, you know, often, especially in this world of like new business, new business acquisition, you know, you get customers in and then people don't spend enough time figuring out how to build that relationship afterwards, how to turn them into, into supporters or evangelists or fans, because, uh, you know, we get them in and you're right. You stick them in an automated process and away we go. (laughs) Yeah. 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 And look, there's, I'm all for automation. I love automation. We use, we use tools to help automate what we do. Um, but here's the thing. When we use tools, tools do not replace the human connection. Tools can merely help us stay on track, stay on point. They can, yes, they can automate communication. They can automate so many things. But at the end of the day, we never sell anything to another company. We always sell, we always market to another human being. And and John, that's why, you know, I talk a little bit about this in the book. I'm not a huge fan of saying like, we discovered the secret or there's the secret, but I actually, I actually do believe that there is a secret to effective marketing or to effective selling. And the secret, again, this is very basic human psychology here. The secret is the word empathy. When we truly empathize with those we're marketing to, when we truly empathize with those that we are selling to, that is the magic ingredient that literally will transform every other aspect whether we're completely automated or not automated at all, that is the magic word. Yeah, listen, that's fantastic. Uh, thank you so much, Wayne. I think that's a great place to end on. I couldn't agree more. I mean, as I said, we're a technology company. We automate a lot of things, but we always try, we always try to focus on making sure that it, it's done for the right reasons and that it's augmented where necessary by, as you said, the human connection so that it's the combination rather than one replacing the other. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Well, this is great. Again, the book, let me hold it up here. Full Circle Marketing, Transform Your Marketing and Turn Customers into Evangelists. I would highly recommend, I will, I will tell you this from experience. This is a quick read, but it's one that you'll go back to because it's, it, there's so many great insights in it. It's, it's easy to read. Um, it's easy to get through. And like I said, packed with insights. And I would really, honestly, highly, highly recommend it. So uh, great book, Wayne. Um, All of Wayne's information is going to be below this video and links to the book as well. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about yourself and your company. Yeah, absolutely. So um, the super quick version of myself. So, you know, I'm the father of four. My wife and I have four kids. Um, They keep us 
running like crazy, ages eight through 14 right now. Um, three boys and a girl, the girl's the baby and she's in charge. <laughs> Make no mistake <laughs> about it. She's in charge. Um, but our company, Ugly Mug Marketing, you know, we work with clients all around the world. Um, our clientele, if I had to, to explain who we work best with, it's growth minded entrepreneurs. That doesn't mean they're all for profit. We work with a lot of not for profit. We actually work with a lot of churches, believe it or not, but their leadership is entrepreneurial and growth minded. That's who we love to work with. Yeah, fantastic. Listen, thanks again, Wayne. Uh, thank you all for uh, listening and watching. Again, some great insights here. So I would really highly, uh, highly advise you to check out Wayne and what he does. My name is John Golden, Sales Pop Online Sales Magazine Pipeliner CRM. I will see you for another interview really soon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.